hope you're having a good summer so far. Things are about to really get crazy here right now. Uh, over the next month, several of our staff are vacationing. Uh, we're tr trying to do it opposite of one another the best we can. Lauren is on vacation right now. Uh, I leave tomorrow. Uh, next Sunday, Zach will be preaching for us. And then the Sunday after that, Brandon. Then I'll be back for a while. But we're just all going to be in and out. And uh, even a lot of our volunteers, our key volunteers, are traveling and doing a lot of things, so a lot of appreciation for those who led worship this morning, but uh, you'll see that, and you're going to be uh, gone too during that time, and so please be in prayer for your church. Remember your church while you're gone. We'd appreciate that a lot. We're in the Life of David is what we're doing right now, a series that we've titled A Person After God's Own Heart. Just real quick, if I could throw a 95-mile-per-hour fastball, I could play for the Cubs. And, and they'd, they'd need me right now, all right? If I could throw a football 60 yards with any level of accuracy, I could play for the Bears right now, and they need me. Uh, if I could shoot 10 three-point shots in just a 20-minute period, I could play for the Bulls. And uh, if I could stop a 100-mile-per-hour black puck, uh, from getting into the net, I could play for the Blackhawks. I can't do any of those things, by the way. I don't want you to think I can, but I can't. Uh, but boy, if I could. I, when I think about goalies, that 100-mile-per-hour black puck, do you know that thing hits them in the head and in the face and in the arms and in their chest? And that's why they have to be completely covered with all these thick pads, the super thick pads from their hips all the way down to their skates. Their, their chest plate is made of Kevlar in order to, to stop that puck from doing any damage. They have a helmet and shoulder pads, and then the last thing they do is they give them a stick. Now, do your best, warrior. Try to fight off all these attacks that are going to come at you, and their sole job is just to keep that puck from getting inside that net. Today, I tell you all of that to tell you that, that David, without any pads on, is going to have to fight off an attack. And what's going to happen is he's going to get a spear thrown at him at really close range. Now, guess who's throwing the spear? Last service, someone said, his wife? <laughs> no. What? Yeah, no. It's his boss. I, I know some of you are in work situations that are not pleasant. I know that. I, I know some of you work for a boss that just creates an extra amount of tension that's not needed in the workplace. I know you would love to see that boss move on. I know you would love to see something where he'd be removed or she would be removed. But God has placed you in that situation. And how you conduct yourself in those kind of moments is very important to God. If you want to know what it means to be a person after God's own heart, today David's going to show you. He's got a boss. You, you know, you might get up and go to a stressful work situation, but at least your boss isn't trying to kill you. David's boss is going to set his heart to killing David. And, and, and so whatever your work situation is, it's not that bad. And yet David is going to conduct himself with a level of ethical behavior that, that is almost unseen in today's modern world. What, the lesson isn't hard today, and it's not going to take us long to get through the passages today, but it calls you and I to a higher level with those that we work with and work for. The young people today, man, I'm excited to talk to you. So just real quick, here's what's happening uh, Israel decided they didn't want God to be their king anymore. They demanded a king. The people chose this really tall, handsome, fighting guy named Saul, but Saul ends up being a really horrible king. Saul will fall off the wagon of uh, obedience to God. He will completely fall off the wagon of obedience. Recently, a whole group of us, we, we decided to go canoeing together. We decided to ride. We put all the canoes on one big open trailer and uh, the, the husbands were all in the lead truck. The wives were all in the truck behind it. At one point, my, my buddy told the wives, you know, you guys can go on ahead of us. And they're like, oh, no, 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 no. We're going to follow the trailer, make sure nothing falls off. Nothing's going to fall off. We dropped a canoe off, by the way. 
Without us even knowing it, totally unaware that it happened, a canoe came off the back of the trailer. It's sliding down the highway. It goes through the grass and up into a bean field, and that's where it landed. And we're still traveling down the road, had no idea. The wives are trying to call us. All of us have our phones on vibrate. We didn't, you know, when we finally, I look back and I realized, oh, we lost a canoe. You know, oh, gosh. All the way back, we knew we had to face our wives. Oh, There'll be no living with him now. Saul falls off the wagon of obedience. He falls off. And and when he does, Satan will put a seed of bitterness, a seed of jealousy inside his heart. Just real quick for you. When you're feeling jealous about something, that's something that Satan has planted into your life. And if you don't deal with your jealousies in the right way, those jealousy, that, that little seed grows into a plant. And then that plant starts to grow into a bush, and that bush begins to grow into a tree. And then that tree starts to produce even bitter fruit. That's why you can't allow bitterness and jealousy to get its wedge into your heart. you got to fight that. But Saul does not do a good job of fighting that. And because he doesn't, The prophet Samuel comes to him and says, by the way, the kingdom is getting taken from you. And and, and taking a kingdom away from a king means you're taking it away from his children also. In this moment, Saul in his his, uh, carelessness reaches out and grabs the prophet. It's found in 1 Samuel 15. As Samuel turned to leave, Saul caught hold of his robe and it tore And Samuel said, oh, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from your hand today and has given it to another, to one better than you, better than you. Ouch, that's got to hurt. Better than you. Well, Saul starts to see this David and his popularity is growing like crazy. David killed Goliath, and so Saul used David as a military leader for a while. He kept sending him out into battles. David just keeps winning and winning and winning. It's obvious that the, the anointing of God is on David's life. He's winning everything. When David comes back into, uh, the, into the kingdom, uh, there's a parade, of course. And Saul, King Saul, Because, you know, he's wise enough to send David out as one of his generals. He's riding in. David is riding in. And everyone breaks into song. Here's how the story is told, 1 Samuel 18. When David and his men were returning home from after defeating the Philistines, the women came from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing and joyful songs with music. As they danced, here's what they sang. Saul has slain his thousands, and David his tens of thousands. Oh boy, Saul was very angry. This refrain displeased him greatly. What? They have credited David with ten thousands? He thought, but with me with only thousands? What more can David get but the whole kingdom? Oh, Saul loved the first verse. You've slain your thought. He loved the first. He did not like the second verse. This song, by the way, that the girls were singing over and over again, every time it did it, break into song, the girls would love to. This song is rising in the charts, by the way. And you're sitting there and you're going, what's the big deal? Killing thousands, killing tens of thousands. Oh, no, come on, make it more personal. Be like me walking in here on a Sunday morning and you all started singing. Ron is awesome. But Zach is way more awesome. You know? Hey, let's stand up. Let's sing that opening chorus that we all love so much. Ron is awesome, but Zach is way more awesome. You know, and then the service is over, and I'm like, man, thank goodness. It's right. and, you know, hey, before we go, let's sing that great chorus we love so much. Ron is awesome. Zach is way more awesome. You know, after a while, I'd be sitting there going, can't we both just be awesome? It would start to wear on you after a while. If, if, you're, if someone's always coming to you telling you, you know, yeah, you're good at what you do, but oh boy, somebody else is way better at it. That's why wives have to be careful sometimes. It's why husbands have to be careful. You don't make comparisons in front of your spouse. 
You know, boy, the way he treats his wife, boy, the way she treats her husband, that's really, you got to be careful of those moments. Satan uses those moments to throw a little seed of bitterness, a little seed of jealousy into a heart, and it begins to grow. And this is what's happening to Saul. Saul is angry, he's upset, and then he will do the unthinkable. He will try to take David's life by his own hand, by throwing a spear at him. Of course, God is protecting David. Oh, Saul goes way beyond that. Saul hires assassins. He sends servants, and he sends people he's hired to kill David. And that happens, and then uh, that doesn't work. So Saul starts sending David out into these battles. But he severely, he's undermanned in all these battles. But the Lord is with David, so David's just winning every battle, even though he doesn't have the manpower to do it. Uh, Eleven times Saul will try to take David's life. Eleven times. How will David respond in all this? You and I who want to be people after God's own heart, this is important. And so then David has to start fleeing. David is running from Saul. It's several chapters of Saul chasing David. Finally, they find themselves out in the desert. David is hiding in a cave, and this is one of the most bizarre stories in Scripture because of the way it's told. Um, and someone, it will, there's a chance someone's always going to get offended if a preacher talks about this story. God put it in his word for a reason. Saul stops to go to the bathroom. He goes into a cave, not knowing that he's in a cave with 600 other men who are his enemy. David's hiding in the back of the cave, right where Saul, the Bible says, is relieving himself. Ron, why would you cover this path? Because it all gives proof to the man that David is. Oh, come on, let's watch what happens here. We're in 1 Samuel 24. Here's the story. Saul came to the sheep pens along the way. A cave was there, and Saul went in to relieve himself. David and his men were far back in the cave. Oh, the men said to David, This is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands, and you can deal with them as you wish. And David crept up unnoticed, but all he did was cut off a corner of Saul's robe. And then afterwards, even that, bothered his conscience. David said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lay a hand on him. And with these words, David sharply rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. And Saul left the cave. Okay, just real quick here. I, I, I learned this uh, as a kid, uh, the King James Version, lift not thy hand against God's anointed, you, you, you know, later on in New Testament tells us that, that God ordains leadership, that God puts certain people in leadership. You might not like the person he put in leadership. You might not like your boss. David had a perfect opportunity to take his boss out. He doesn't do it. He just cuts off a part of his robe. Saul leaves the cave. When he gets outside the cave, David comes out and he says, Saul... Just a moment, I am not your enemy. David bows to the ground in front of his enemy and, and, and says, look, here, I cut off a little piece of your robe, which means I had a knife and I was this close to you and I could have taken you out and I didn't. David could have done away with his enemy, seized the kingdom, but it wasn't God's timing and it wasn't God's way. All right. Oh, by the way, when Saul sees this moment, uh, when he sees the ethics of David, it impacts him so deeply that he starts to weep. Saul then totally backs off. In fact, in, in verse 19, the story ends this way. Saul said, when a man finds his enemy, does he let him get away unharmed? May the Lord reward you well for the way that you treated me today. I know that you will surely be king and that the kingdom of Israel will be established in your hands. This is the moment of King Saul starting to accept what's coming. All right. 
Here's the practical. Can I talk to the young people in the room for just a minute, the teenagers in the room? You're entering the workforce, and you're entering the workforce as a follower of Jesus Christ, as a Christian. And so there is an expectation of your work ethic that's going to be different than those around you. You know what? Uh, We need you to show up and to work hard. We need you to not badmouth your boss when he's not looking. Uh, We need you to support your supervisors, regardless of how mean she might be. We need you to be on time and early, and we need you to give a strong work ethic because how you work at your job is a testimony to how God is working in you. You don't go to work with this expectation that the world owes you something. You're there to work hard, to earn a living, and to be a testimony for God. But even as I say all of that, the rest of us, this isn't just a lesson for teenagers. There's something going on here that's huge. David was the anointed king of Israel. He just hadn't taken the position yet. Catch this. When you and I become the anointed of God, the children of God, you should expect the attack. When God calls you to be one of his followers, you should expect Satan is going to attack. (laughs) And it happens to all of us. It happens to your pastors. It happens to your elders. It happens to the people you admire. It, we might look like we have it all together, but we've been under the same attacks that you've been under. We get attacked by people we don't know. We get attacked by good people we know well. We get attacked by family members. Our marriages are constantly under attack. Our families are constantly under attack. Same that you're under. When you become a follower of Jesus, doesn't mean your whole life becomes easy, just the opposite. It becomes intense. Now, catch this. In that moment, you have a choice. You can respond with vengeance, which is a very human thing to do, or you can let it go, which is a supernatural thing to do. What David does in this moment because his men were all telling him, take his life. (laughs) This is your chance to get rid of your enemy. They totally misread the moment. David, who had a heart, who was a person after God's own heart, read it correctly. No, I'm going to let it go and let that be a testimony in this moment. David does the supernatural thing. How did David do that the same way you and I can do it? Catch this. When you became a follower of Jesus Christ, Jesus put his spirit into you, the Holy Spirit into you. And what you're not capable of pulling off as a human, you are capable of pulling off because of the spirit. I can let it go. Is that easy? (laughs) No. Not when you're mad. Not when you're injured. Not when you've been attacked. Is it easy to let it go? It's not. I have failed many times. But with the Spirit's help, I can do it. I'm wondering what you need to let go today. You know, your, your spouse is not your enemy. You might be angry. They may have wounded you, but your spouse is not your enemy today. Your boss is not your enemy. Satan is your enemy. And so somewhere inside of you is this ability to be a person after God's own heart. And so even with my irritating supervisor, I'm just going to choose to let it go. Does that sound like something you could do today? Father in heaven, this life is hard. Relationships, hard. Family, hard. Marriage is hard. Father, it's just a tough world sometimes to get through. And I think what you need from your people today 
from your anointed is people who are just willing to let it go. And so we're going to need your help. That is not a human thing to do. (laughs) That's not natural to let it go. It's very supernatural. And the only way we're going to pull off the supernatural, Father, is if you're in us helping us to do that. Father, fill us with the Spirit. As I'm speaking right now, convict, convict us if we need conviction. Fill us with your spirit and comfort if we need the comfort, but help us to mount up a grace and a forgiveness that nobody else could pull off. Father, with the Spirit's help, we can do this. Thank you for your Son. Thank you for the Spirit, and thank you for being our Father. In Jesus' name, and everyone said...